Italy and uh, Brazil, certainly the first name that comes in, I think I met her the first time was in, uh, in Rome, in Italy, a certain number of years that we don't mention, I was in the office of Enrico Pesuti, he's still a collaborator. Um, it will be too long to make the list of all the merits of uh, Maria Oraria. Uh, I want only to mention some statistics in her career, which extends for a certain number of years, she had 70 collaborators, if I'm not wrong. Of these 70 collaborators, there are 14 Italian. <laughs> so <laughs> there's been a quite, quite uh, incredible uh, interaction between, uh, between uh, the representing the probability between her work and the Italian probabilist work, and I'll say in particular in the community of the statistical mechanics. Um, so, she has signed some of the most influential articles in uh, statistical mechanics, and in particular in the domain of uh, interacting particles out of equilibrium. You know, today she will talk about an argument of equilibrium statistical mechanics. And I would say that uh, uh, she has been a pioneer and still a leader of uh, the probability school in uh, Brazil, which is now a very strong school mostly dedicated to this type of uh, team, and uh, uh, it is also merit of Mary Oraria. So today we will talk about phase transition in the easing speed system. Thank you. Thank you, Stefano. And I first want to thank the organizers for making this uh, beautiful and interesting meeting, especially I can imagine how hard it is to organize a meeting this year in Brazil. And uh, I want to thank also for giving me the, the opportunity. I had a hard, a hard time thinking what to speak because uh, for a, a more general audience and uh, had to choose uh, choosing something that uh, involves my uh, great friends and collaborators also from Italy. So I decided to speak about, it's a part of a project uh, that is going on, but uh, what I will tell is just part of it, which uh, developed mostly with uh, Luis Renato Fontes and Domingos Marchetti from Sao Paulo and uh, Titi Merola and Enrico Presuti from L'Aquila. So it deals with uh, a kind of uh, spin systems. So uh, our goal is to understand better some sort of spin systems, which uh, we think them as layered in along one, uh, along each layer you have a certain type of interaction, which is called cat's type, and that means is a spread out interaction, very weak and very long range. And uh, in the other direction, uh, transversal, you have a very short range interaction, usually uh, say the most uh, classical example, the easing model. So this kind of thing. So cat's type interactions, think like that. You have a certain a given function j, let us think it's a compact support if you want, and you rescale your interaction as, as uh, indicated there. So gamma is a scale parameter, and you think of gamma as small. So gamma is smaller, the interaction is very weak and very spread out. And, um, this is the general definition in any dimension. This model was introduced by Katz, Ullenbeck, and Hammer in 1960s, and um, it was further extended by Lebowitz and Perros, and it played a very important role, and it still plays, but it, at that time, to, that was the first uh, way to rigorously connect Van der Waals Maxwell theory which is 19th century, I put the date there, so something everybody knows from the school, and to statistical mechanics. So since this is a um, uh, general lecture, let me maybe say the two words which are there, okay? The, he call you what means that. So Van der Waals Maxwell theory, everybody knows the Van der Waals isotherm. So you just take the the equation of the ideal gas, P um, V equal to KT, P is the pressure, V 
is the volume per, part, per particle, and uh, T temperature, K is a constant, and you, uh, the van der Waals did, yeah? so put something which uh, gives you an interaction. So there is this term which is A over V squared, which uh, accounts for uh, an attractive interaction long range, and there is a B which accounts for the fact that molecules cannot be at the same place, no? cannot occupy the same place. So if you look at that, and it has the picture there, which is just uh, drawn, drawn by hand, if T is temperature is large, this more or less look like the ideal gas. But uh, there is a critical temperature where you see some, here it is, where there is an inflection point, and then below the critical temperature you have something very strange. No, you have this picture, which is of course uh, incompatible with physics because you have a situation where the density is uh, decreasing, V is increasing, V is one over the density, and the pressure is increasing. So it doesn't make sense physically. Then Maxwell came and uh, proposed a correction for that. And the correction he proposed is saying, well, it's when temperature is below the critical, uh, critical temperature, you should uh, uh, put a flat part for the pressure, and this is uh, chosen in such a way that the area above and below are the same. Okay, so this is Maxwell, this is the 19th century, and uh, all this argument is based on, um, on thermodynamics and some sort of mean field argument, and, uh, of, and the, the correction of Maxwell uh, brings in the fact that you, when you are, the water uh, is uh, evaporating, is uh, boiling, it doesn't uh, evaporate automatically, uh, immediately. So there is some coexistence between the two phases, uh, gas and uh, liquid, and that's uh, a system which is not homogeneous. Okay, so you want to connect that with uh, statistical mechanics. But before I go, let's, this very old thing is also has some important thing regarding metastability, because if you remember, the, you look a little bit beyond the, that, you have this little branch. This have some, was thought, uh, suggesting something related to metastability, when you have a super, uh, super saturated uh, uh, vapor, okay? So we want to connect to statistical mechanics. So let me say, Instead of thinking of a very complicated system, let us make it a very simple, and that's uh, very simple means uh, what's called the lattice gas. So imagine your volume is, is split into little cells. In each cell, only one molecule can be, so you have or not have a particle, and it doesn't matter much where the particle is in that little cell. So that means you can translate your configuration into uh, zero one configuration, lambda, is the um, a subset of, say, ZD, no? so it's in the lattice. So that's why the, and you have an energy, which is what is written here, and uh, another piece, so this is the Hamiltonian. So this J, that's the one we are thinking, so this J is positive, so you see that you have a minus, something positive, that means attractive. Decreases the energy if you have and the age there uh, controls the density, okay? So that's called the Newton. So that's why I want to say J positive. And let us say the sum is, is finite for each fixed, uh, so the interaction of one guy with the whole world is finite. So you have some probability measure, which is e to the minus beta H. Beta is interpreted as the inverse of the temperature, and you normalize, Z is just the normalization to make this a probability. If lambda is finite, no problem, it's a very simple thing, conceptually very simple. Okay, so the, the connection is when you make uh, your volume tend to infinity, that means because this represents something microscopic, and standing to infinity means you take into account of that, you call this a thermodynamic limit, because exactly it allows you to connect with thermodynamics. That was the, this very classical thing. Okay, so here lambda is finite. Uh, 
And what happens when you make this thermodynamic limit, for instance, you have a very important observable, which is a very important thing, not observable, which is called the uh, pressure. So pressure is simply that, okay? The limit of the log of the z divided by one over beta lambda. So this pressure is uh, extremely important. For instance, if you, if there is, if it is differentiable, you take the derivative, you get the density, and you take, if you take sub subsequent derivatives, you have something. You just look here. If you take the derivative of uh, the the log of z, you get uh, cumulants, cumulants of the expected value of the variable. I mean the expected value of uh, the number of particles. Okay, so you have this object, this uh, important object, which is called the pressure. In the same way, you have something which is called the free energy, which it is, is a different way to look, which is called the canonical ensemble. That means you fix the total number of particles, fix the density, so and you sum only on the configurations which have a certain given density. And there is a minus here because it's a, the, the way it is no convention. So that means the minimum of F carry more measure. Okay, the minimum, total minimum of F is the somehow the typical density of your state. Okay, so these two functions are convex under those conditions which I mentioned, and they are the Legend transform one of each other. So this allows to go from one sample from one situation when you fix the density to another when you don't fix the density, which is called the equivalence of ensembles. That's a very important concept. Okay, phase transitions have to do when this, uh, there is, uh, these functions fail to be analytic somewhere. Okay, you can think like that. But we are going to look at phase transition in a more probabilistic way. Okay, so what's the relation of this whatsoever with the van der Waals? Well, if you were taking a mean field, what means a mean field? Every, a guy interacts with the rest of the world without looking who is who. Interacts in the same way with everybody. So this means that you take a J, which is simply one over the volume. Of course, this is a very strange thing. You have an interaction that depends on the volume. But anyway, if you take this J and you do this procedure, you will get Maxwell correction. That's a kind of interesting thing. But of course, this is not a physical thing, and you have some, some problem that the free energy for this simple mean field will be something like that, not convex. It's too minimum. These two guys, oh, I did something wrong, okay. Should be the same, no? But I am very bad for any mean, too minimum. Uh, that corresponds to the fact that uh, those points of the of the pressure, but anyway, so there is something strange. It's not uh, though there is something good that you recover Maxwell correction, but it's not uh, physically meaningful. So the cuts interaction played uh, exactly the role of making doing this job, making this connection. So when you make the take your interaction J gamma that I said, you make the thermodynamic limit. And then afterwards you send gamma to zero. Gamma is a parameter of your model. In this double limit, you do get the convex envelope of the mean field. So you, you have a, a model which for each gamma is totally, re, uh, totally inside the usual statistical mechanics, equilibrium statistical mechanics. And when you send gamma to zero, you get uh, them. So that was the main importance the initial importance, the main reason for this, I think that was very important set of articles in the 60s. Then, as far as I can understand, uh, this subject was not growing too much, at least from what I could see. But in the 90s, you got a lot of very beautiful and very deep things. So, since I don't want to be technical in this lecture, let me spend some time uh, mentioning this, these things, okay? So uh, besides the, the interesting connection, the interesting facts of statistical mechanics, the, it's a very rich kind of model that allows you to develop very nice, interesting mathematical ideas, uh, kind of coarse grain that you need to look at your system. Instead of looking zero ones, you need to look at it in a, in a change of scale, let us say, in a rough way. 
that's called coarse grain as usual, no? And some variation of problems that of course will appear because your system, there is no reason to be homogeneous everywhere always, no? Only the equilibrium. So it's very important that you are able to look not only a e free energy function, but also free energy functional that looks at your profile of the, of the magnetization uh, uh, or the density. Here I was talking about the gas, so the density. So and among these, I, I took these three, three or four papers because I think they are, I, I mean, I find them excellent uh, s examples of this. So a very important question is to say, well, I mean, you do two limits. What happens for gamma is small, but not zero. So this was investigated uh, uh, in these two papers by Marzo Cassandra Hiko Prezuti and by Anton Bovier and Zaradnik, Miller Zaradnik. So that means uh, the other papers, not only these two, but i sorry because I, I know that I, but uh, to say, what can you say about the critical temperature for gamma is small as gamma goes to zero? So another important thing that I think that uh, boosts a lot of this is that uh, you lack proofs of phase transition in the continuum. And uh, using this kind of model, a very important paper, Lebovitz, Mazel, and Prezuti, uh, were able to show. I mean, the, of course, it's far still from, from done because in the, you want that uh, the repulsive, uh, repulsive uh, forces, which are short range, are short range, and the long one, the attractive are long range. This is a little bit different. Everything is sort of uh, uh, long range. And the other thing which I put here because it speaks a lot to me has to do with the, those branches that I said in the Van der Waals uh, Maxwell theory. You have this. Uh, the brains, which are called the metastable brains, and uh, one wants to understand, does it, there were a lot of um, discussions, uh, proposals about metastability, if you could see metastability also in this picture. And uh, there is this paper, which I think is very important, by uh, Sasha Friedel and Charles Hister, which shows uh, that if you take a gamma small and J short uh, finite range, compact support, there is no analytic continuation. And uh, this appears in the limits. So they understand how when you make gamma small, you get nicer and nicer functions, more derivatives. So I think this is, uh, it. so now let me go to my model, to the model that I want to talk. So now I go to something very specific. So but it's going to be a model on the plane. So my layers for the moment are just one dimensional things. And in these horizontal layers, I have a cut type of interaction, as I said before. And the vertical ones, I have a nearest neighbor interaction. So this is what is written there. So I have uh, on, the long, on the horizontal, and then on the nearest neighbor, I have minus epsilon. So the guy interacts with those which are in the same layer, looking at everyone in, within a range one over gamma, more or less in the same way. And with the neighbor, he gives this, he wants to align with the neighbor in this way, okay? So this is the model. And um, I should say something here. I'm taking J to be the integral equal to one. Ah, okay, I forgot to say, I did a mistake here because before we were talking of zero one. I prefer to speak about uh, plus minus one. So the interpretation now of the average is the, so I think of, the, you think of this of little magnets. So the, instead of the density, you have the magnetization, the average. So it's just, mathematically, it's just the same. So it's plus or minus one. And then the sum, the J is normalized so that the sum here, the integral is one. And I'm going, in fact, to normalize that the, the sum is one. So what does it mean that when I do that, the critical, the critical mean field critical temperature mean field is equal to one because it's this one. Just analyzing the simple, this I don't need to enter in details, that very simple function of mean field, okay? So I have taken like that. So the critical mean field critical temperature is one. And the question is, okay, 
at this model, it's a one, look at only one layer. At, in one dimension, if you have something, finite range, because J is compact support, there is no phase transition. It's uh, like a Markov chain. So you ask, is it true that you, when you locate yourself at a mean field critical temperature, and whatever is epsilon, no small how matter it is, do you have multiple Gibbs measures, infinite volume Gibbs measures? That means, do you have phase transitions? That was the question we asked. So given epsilon positive, for all gamma is small, we do have two DLR measures. So if you take, uh, you can think like that, if you put boundary condition plus, it will give you in the limit, thermodynamic limit, it will give you one measure, which is different than if you put boundary condition minus. That, was, that is the theorem which I want to tell a little bit about, okay? But before I say something about that, uh, I should comment some related things. So, if instead of taking the critical beta, the mean field critical one, I would take a beta larger than one, then of course in one dimension you still do not have phase transition because it's finite range. But in the mean field, there is a spontaneous magnetization because there are two solutions of that equation if, uh, if beta is bigger than one. Okay, so, and this appears in the spin systems in the following way. The, the, the one-dimensional system is like very long, uh, very long intervals where you do have a positive magnetization, then very long ones when you have a minus magnetization and so on. These are very long, exponentially long. So it's not surprising that if you take that, you can take your epsilon very small, polynomially small, how much uh, does matter, and still you do have uh, phase transition. That's Ah, yeah, no, yeah, because I didn't write here. Uh, here my epsilon is fixed. Uh, yeah, it's the vertical one. So here my epsilon is fixed, but here I want to say that even if you make epsilon equal to epsilon of gamma, like gamma to the 2000, it's still there is a phase transition, okay? Because the other guys are exponentially long. You can prove that. that that's something we proved. It's another, another theorem, but I didn't have, uh, I have to choose, okay? So this model is, um, mathematically, is very uh, related to, you can, we are talking about classical spins, but you can do it in the quantum, uh, set up by, by, using Feynman cuts. So there is some, see, some model which is related to that and has been studied uh, by Eisman, Fly, and Newman and also more recently by Dima Yoffe and Anna Levy. They, they studied this model. They, it's not, um, not answering the same questions, the analogous question, but they studied. Uh, J, J, yeah, one example that you can think is the most simpler. So let us think that uh, it's just like that. <laughs> so in the, when you scale, it becomes like that. And in such a way that I put that uh, the area is one. So my picture is bad, uh, the area is one. Okay. Uh, one thing that is important to say that the general lebowitz penrose theory it doesn't apply because uh, for that theory to work, the J uh, has to have, uh, has to be d-dimensional. So this, uh, if you have, uh, so you're, you have to interact in all directions with one over gamma. So it doesn't fit. Uh, one question which is, uh, we are struggling a little bit and uh, working also with uh, Tom Manfred on that, is to say, in our case now with beta, beta equal to one, which is the value of B, such that if you make epsilon like a constant times gamma to the B, uh, it's there is a, phase tr a transition in the behavior for K is small, kappa is small, you do not have phase transition for kappa large you have. So uh, we, are, uh, we, did, we don't still have a proof of that, but we are working on that, okay? So, uh, let me uh, outline which is the kind of arguments because probably I will not be able to, 
to not have time to go to all the arguments which I kind of pretend uh, wrote <laughs> in this slide. So let me uh, start. So one thing that we did, um, and I will, it's a sort of uh, a trick which is cheap, makes life easy, and has a very big minus that doesn't allow us to use anti-ferromagnetic interactions. Um, I'm going to consider very long uh, intervals. I mean, split like that, my lattice. I don't tell now for the moment how, what are these lengths here. These lengths are bigger than gamma minus one. Gamma minus one minus something. And we are going to do the following. Let us, instead of working with our model, work with a model in which you keep you keep these interactions, you keep this, the vertical ones, you keep this, this, and this, in a sort of a chessboard fashion. And you don't keep the others, you, you make them, you ignore them, okay? So this is a strange Hamiltonian, so you have this intervals and you do that. And uh, if you do prove that this model shows, uh, has two different measures, and you have uh, one measure mu plus, which you have a positive expectation of this, of the, magnet, the magnet, a positive magnetization. The same will hold for the the full volume, the full model, for because of uh, Griffith's inequality, that the expectation of the spin will be bigger. That is a general inequality. So it's exploiting the fact that we are in a ferromagnetic system. You can play with this. And why it's good to play with this? Well, because if you play with this, you somehow split your system into pair, these pairs of long two-dimensional things, uh, one-dimensional things, two, two spins. No? So somehow it tells you maybe uh, if you look at a one-dimensional system with just two layers and you can compute the mean field uh, free energy, you can compute the mean field and discover that there is a, a spontaneous magnetization, M, that depends on epsilon. Then you are in the situation of the Katz model with a beta larger than one somehow conceptually. And you should be able to prove. Of course, there is a lot of mathematics to do, but that's the kind of belief because it makes life easier to do, not mathem to implement mathematically. Of course, it's a weaker, uh, it's a theorem with less, is a, a system with less interaction, and it's ferromagnetic, so by Griffith's inequality, if I have a, sponsor, have a phase transition here, I'll have the other one. Okay, that's what we do. So prim uh, preliminary, we look at this mean field free energy of two layers, which is just calculus, and uh, simple probability. And then uh, we try to, to implement the lebowitz penrose procedure for this two-dimensional system. That's the kind of do. In order to do that, the crucial thing when you want to prove phase transition is Pyre's estimate. So Pyre's estimate means you imagine that very far away from the origin outside something, you have a constant thing plus. And then you say, do I pay a lot to have a minus sitting at the origin? That the probability in the limit will be less than a half? If this is the case, then you do have two measures because when you put a minus, there is a spin a symmetry, you put a minus and there will be a different measure. So this is very old, uh, generally like this, is a very classical argument which was um, invented by Pyers in 1930s to show that the easy model has a phase transition in dimension two or more. You know, because easy model is the most famous model which was invented uh, by Lenz, who was an advisor of Easy, and he gave to Easy for, for his PhD thesis. Easy did the one dimension, sees that there is no phase transition, conjecture that that would be the same in any dimension, that's not a very interesting model. Okay, the fact that he was wrong made him famous. No, <laughs> so, but that's the way it goes. So this is Pyre's uh, bound that uh, here it's different, but uh, we, sh we need to do. Okay, uh, in order to implement uh, this, uh, since we have this model with uh, gammas, we need to make some sort of uh, 
coarse grain description, and that involves playing with different scales. Though there is a scale gamma minus a half, that's the scale in which you make an approximation of by con a continuous. So you approximate your system by by continuous thing by putting this coarse grain. So that's when you coarse grain. Then there is a gamma uh, some scale which is just below gamma minus one, so it's smaller than the range of interaction, and one which is just above, which is L plus. And then there is some uh, error terms, some, um, some, um, something which I, in which I don't care, some, some uh, zeta there, which I'm calling, okay? So, and then I consider the magnetizations in these scales. So I split the interval, the z, into box, into intervals of a certain length. And I look at magnetization in these scales. It's not very, I need to run a little bit. So um, uh, this I already mentioned, so, so I don't need to spend time on that. Uh, so I told you we look at this, we had this trick. We played these two layers to guess the spontaneous magnetization. So it's a simple computation. If you have two layers, forget the mean field, for instance, just think of the vertical. So it's just a one-dimensional system. You have, uh, uh, they are independent things and they have pairs. So it's a trivial computation to, to get what is the free energy for this. It's a simple combinatoric thing. Then, by putting the mean field, the natural gas, I mean, just follow what you know from, from mean field, you put this minus m squared. This is the one that you had in van der Waals, a over v squared. That's done. Okay, so this guy is the, should be the free energy for the system. And you can make uh, simple calculus to see that this guy, this function f hat, I call it f hat, has two minimizers for epsilon small. Okay, it's calculus. So you get that, you are in good shape, you believe that you can do something because you detect spontaneous magnetization for mean field. So you go on and now you need to, to work. Okay, in order to work, you need to create the setup for the proper pairs uh, arguments in this scale. So here is, uh, we need to look at uh, different spins. So we need to, we take some boxes that I don't want to be very, very specific, but I took some boxes. And what happens is that I made these boxes in such a way that there is no vertical interaction from a box with the outside. So they are put in this way. I paved uh, Z2 with these boxes. Okay, this is what I call Q. Just because it's convenient. So the spins in the, the box do not interact with the outside vertically. Okay? And now I need to say to which spins we are going to apply the pirate construction. So uh, I'm going to say that the uh, ether variable is plus, minus, or zero according to it is the average is close to m epsilon, it's close to minus m epsilon, then it's a plus or a minus, otherwise it's undetermined, and I call it a zero, I say it's undetermined. And now when I look at the Q, a Q, I'm going to say that the Q is plus, minus, or zero if all the atoms in the Q are plus, Say I will say that the Q is plus if all the atoms in the Q are plus, plus the atoms in the Qs which are neighbor. So I have a three by three, three by three matrix of Qs. When this happens, I will say that I am in the plus phase. Otherwise, I am in the minus. And if uh, none of this happens, I am undetermined. So this is the usual kind of thing when you want to do with long range things. Okay. Then you, you say that you have, uh, imagine now we fix the boundary conditions such that outside a certain compact set we have only once. You can find boundary conditions which will make that. Okay? So I'm going to think these two boundary conditions, once and minus one. I want to say that they bring different methods. Okay? So I'm going to say that uh, a contour now contour is more complicated than in the easy thing. It's a pair where I have a, a set, which is called support of the contour, gamma, 
And th that means uh, maximum connected component of undetermined region. Con connected in this way. Two Qs are connected if they are uh, the, in the diagonals also, okay? So this is, and there is the eta configuration inside also, which can be. Okay, that's what I call the contour. And um, when you play with that, you can uh, think of the analog of using finite measures with certain boundary conditions, conditions, and I call this mu plus, mu minus. When I look at these configurations in the union of return of uh, things, I have run down. So I need to prove that I have a Pyrus estimate. That means the probability of having something far from, I mean, if I put plus uh, one outside, to have a zero, to have at the origin something which is not one for theta is going to be small. And the crucial thing for that is to estimate this. You sum all the, the that's the partition functions, like the probability, no? Or when you do have a contour and when you don't have. So this is the price of a contour, if you want to say. So there is this Pyers bound, which we need to prove, that it gives it something like that. Proving that, we are done, because it's the same kind of argument. So, as in the easy. Once you prove that estimate, you want to say, what's the probability in the plus that I have uh, at the origin something which is not one? I want to see that it's less than a half, just to see that it's different than if you put a minus, uh, zero, a minus outside. And then you, I mean, given that estimate, you just have to, I mean, the fact the fact that you have at zero something which is not one means that zero is in not in the support of a, of a contour, but in the convex envelope of the support. But then you just can make some computation with the entropy, how many possibilities you shift all, all cu uh, cubes which have in your support, and then you think that there is the entropy which comes from the configuration eta, but that's you control also, it's three to the uh, number divided by L plus, how many possibilities you have. And if you do that, it's a simple computation to see that you get something like that. And it's uh, given that these guys you can play, they are small, you can make this go to zero as gamma goes to zero. And that shows the thing. I, I think I have uh, two minutes. Yeah, maybe, so I just say something, what it has to do with Pyre's estimate. So Pyrus estimate, I need to estimate the partition function. So you write the partition function, you have this um, coarse grain, so it brings you to the free energy functional. So there is some upper, oops, some upper bound like that, F is that functional which is there, a lower bound like that, this arrows take into account the entropy and the, the flexibility that M is not fixed. So you have this, this is, a, this is a simple thing to do. And then you need to have a, you have a variational problem with your Fs. And you need to prove something. You need to prove that when you are outside the, the right thing, you pay something which is more than the error which you are making this estimation, which was in the previous transparency. So you need to, to estimate the inf of the, of the free energy in some, uh, in your set, you know, which is the support of your contour. And uh, you need to work a little bit on that. If you do that, there is all terms which are not very important. The main term is this one, let us say, which is the bulk. And you need to prove that this is okay, that from the, you get an estimate in the numerator, which will be consistent with the, the numerator. And here there is something which is, uh, important that we have plus or minus spins. That there is something which cancels when you sum the, the sigmas in the, where you can sum, which is that the fact that you have here a plus, which is those uh, contours in the middle that I didn't have time to, to think. So this makes life easier because you have plus minus spins, not true if you, because it's uh, natural to think of continuous spin, a system of hard rods. So by working on that, uh, it's, a, it's a lot of work. A paper is kind of, uh, you need to, to make some work. You can prove, uh, you can prove an estimate because regarding the, more or less following the usual thing and allows you to 
to to get a sort of bios bound. It's a general kind of strategy, and I maybe finish just with a few things. As I said, we were weak in order to uh, didn't take the challenge to do uh, the Lebovitz pinholes for the full volume, for the full Hamiltonian. And uh, these people, Cassandro, Colangeli, and Prezuti, they, they did it. Okay, for our problem, it doesn't change too much because just that instead of having three, they had six here. But for us, but it's important by itself because it's, uh, much, it's much harder. So uh, there are nat natural questions. Um, the bad, the bad thing of this approach is that can we put something anti-ferromagnetic? So, and it breaks down, so it's very interesting to, to be able to do something with anti-ferromagnetic. Another question is can we do something for continuous spins? And that's important because Katz himself, and there's uh, this paper, Katz and Help, they, they had something which looks like this model for a system of hard loads but there is no result, so just proposing the model and discussing is something that's time. Another, a very, I think, which is a very interesting question is if you take uh, higher dimensions, so instead of Z2, you are in Z3 or Z4, and the layers are higher dimension, does it exist some sort of Dubrovskian state? Uh, uh, so all these are completely, the problem, the only one that we are really uh, close to get is the, the critical, Epsilon. The rest is more or less lost, especially anti-ferromagnetic, which would be very beautiful, but uh, thank you. So.